We are continuing our coverage, of course, today on the Court of Appeal blocking the Trans Mountain Expansion Project. Let's now take you to B.C., the B.C. Legislature in Victoria, B.C., where we have Andrew Weaver standing by. He's the leader of the B.C. Green Party. Good to be able to speak with you again and get your reaction. What is your reaction to today's news? Well, obviously, uh, I'm quite pleased with the decision. Uh, it's a combination of a long time on this file, and I know some would say that uh, there's still potential appeals and so forth. But in my view, this really is the uh, the death knell for the for this for this uh, project. You know. Um, the, the key aspect of this is two parts of this ruling that are critical, of course, and I'm very grateful to the tsleil Squamish, Kamloops, Coldwater, and other nations who've who, who put, really put their resources front and center uh, to, to assert their, their, their constitutional right for consultation. But it, from, from my perspective in this decision as well is something that I have worked very hard on, and that is to re get the government to recognize that the marine component of the assessment was so fundamentally flawed and that it should never have been approved. And in fact, the words used by the judge today, that it was impermissibly flawed, actually, in my view, gives me a great sense of vindication, because that has been the focus of our intervention for five years now. Um, you know, the, the previous process was fundamentally flawed. I, I, the example I like to use is that the entire oil spill response was predicated on the existence of 20 hours of sunlight. Uh, and there's other conditions like calm winds offshore. But there is no latitude south of Tuk to Yuk Tuk that ever has 20 hours of sunlight, let alone the depths of winter when you'd be lucky to get 12 hours. You, you, well, you don't get 12 hours of sunlight. So the, when, we're, when these questions were brought to the attention of the NEB, rather than actually have them consider them, they were dismissed. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, su suggested that there was a rig in. And what's critical about that the is you, Prime the, Minister you, you Trudeau think, campaigned on that as well. So you, you think that you said, you just said now, and you said this in other interviews today, from what I understand, you think that the system was rigged. Absolutely. Without any doubt that, that, in my view, that the decision was made and what we went through in the NED, NEB process was a grand example of decision-based evidence making as opposed to what we need in our society and in public policy is evidence-based decision making. It was clear to me that this was going ahead and that the evidence was sought to justify it, but you don't have to believe me. The ruling today is unequivocal in, in, in reaffirming that, both from the scientific perspective, which I, I addressed, with respect to the, uh, okay. uh, the, the issue of the marine traffic, as well as the fact that consultation was not consultation. It so, was one way. There was no dialogue. So we, we've heard from our finance minister that they are going to go back to the uh, board here and, and review what has taken place today. And the finance minister on BNN Bloomberg in an interview today remains very committed to getting this done. They do believe that this project, this pipeline, will get built and as you know, and as we all know, the Canadian taxpayer is on the hook for this $4.5 billion pipeline now that they have bought back from Kinder Morgan, and they are very intent in getting this done. You don't think they're going to get this done? Absolutely not. And Why? it's not $4.5 billion. And anyone who thinks it's $4.5 billion needs to add another couple of billion because this process has just dragged out for another couple of years. And, and, and in fact, if we, the NEB had actually previously uh, suggested it would actually uh, uh, respond to the concerns that were raised, we would have had an awful lot of, uh, of, of different uh, uh, systems and measures put in place. You know, again, I come back to this. It is utterly reckless what the federal government is doing. They have made this decision based on purely political cynicism and calculation that they wanted to have a national climate plan which they've since watered down and really is it, it's it's not even what they initially proposed and they needed Alberta to be part of that and to get Alberta in they needed to offer them something and that was a pipeline to the coast but they needed British Columbia to remove its five conditions and on those five conditions there was a couple about world-class spill responses but suddenly and the, these conditions were vaporized including one where the uh, the BC Liberals had suggested that you need to ensure indigenous partnership and consultation which again was reaffirmed that didn't occur. And, and so, but in order to get BC's approval, you needed to approve Site C in Pacific Northwest. And heaven forbid we put a pipeline to the eastern refineries on the East Coast, because that would go through Quebec where there's a lot of liberal seats. You sound cynical because that's what was at the scale of the decision making. It was never based on evidence, it was pure political calculation. And when you make decisions in public policy based on political calculation, it becomes a house of cards that starts to unravel. And that is exactly what well, we're seeing now. So I suspect. 
I suggest that this is going to be the, kicked past the next federal election, but I suggest that the taxpayer is going to be on the hook, and I applaud the executives in Kinder Morgan International who have seen a, a, a way to divest themselves and protect their shareholders from actually an asset that really was looking for a, a market because the original market and the original justification for Kinder Morgan was predicated on 100 to 150 barrel uh, 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 dollars a barrel oil, and it was predicated on there being refineries that wanted it, and there was no Keystone Pipeline, there was no Louisiana Loop Facility, which get the much, much bigger tanks in, and there was no international move away from high sulfur fuels in marine, marine travel, and there was no international move against, uh, you know, uh, to push, to go away from heavy oil and actually go to the lighter crudes, which were still able to get out to market very cheaply. You, you know, so this you doesn't have an economic case, well, it's it purely does political, have an, it does and, and frankly, uh, you know, shame on the federal government if they continue down this path. But it does have an economic case. You talk about this as being politically calculated. Many people would say that this is in Canada's national interest. This is not a provincial matter. This is Canada's national economic interest. We have heard today on BNN, in, in addition to Finance Minister Bill Morneau, Brad Wall, Jean Charest, Gwen Morgan, who look at this and, and recognize that global investors don't have an interest in investing in Canada, either through infrastructure, recognizing that within our own domestic policies, we cannot get pipelines and infrastructure built. They are turning away from investing and having an interest in Canada. If you didn't see Utter it, nonsense. or if you want to see it, nonsense. if you want to see it, just take a look it, at the markets. Take a look at the price of crude oil, which continued no. to move higher because of supply constraints globally. And yet the energy shares on the TSX were, Again, were down a big under. It's not false. Take a look at the numbers. Take a look at the markets. And, and those heavy oil producers no, were down 6 to 7 percent. It has an economic, it has an economic impact on all of Canada, all Canadians. Again, what you, are, what you are offering the viewers here is the rhetoric that has been offered by certain vested interests. The reality is investment is booming in Canada. Come to British Columbia, the strongest economy in, in all of Canada. What, are we investing in pipelines? No. Our economy is booming that's because one we're province. positioning ourselves. But that's as, one province. Uh, well, let's, let's continue that. Let's go look at the royalty. Let's, let's, wait, well, let, let's wait, look let's at the look at one number. Let's look at one number. One no, let me ask. Uh, Let's you, at, no, let's let, let me ask sure. you to look but at you have one to number today. Assert numbers Hold on. As, a, as opposed one, to your opinion. I, sure, I'm happy to listen to numbers. It's not my opinion. I'm looking at the TSX. I'm looking at the energy shares. I'm looking at the price of crude oil mm -hmm. going higher. I'm looking at all of our Canadian dollar going down today on the back of this news. And one other number that we got today was the most recent GDP figure for the most recent month. The last yep. month of the last quarter that we have a reading for is flat. Flats zero. Right, and, and zero. our GDP. That's not two that's percent not of our great GDP. Great economic growth. Two. Per well, excuse me, 2% of our GDP is based on oil. That is a fact. Whether you like it or not, that is a fact. So any change or growth in GDP is unrelated to oil. When people quote oil being 10% or higher, what they're doing is they're talking about the entire energy sector, which includes all of our natural gas, it includes our hydro, it includes wind power, it includes all of our energy systems. So we know that our economy is not dependent on oil, and the reason why we know that tax is because is Alberta is hurting. Well, let me finish, tax please. Revenue the, the is Alberta is actually hurt. You, could you let me finish if you're going to ask me a question? Alberta is actually hurting right now, at precise, but Canada is, is in terms of the oil. But our GDP is not dropping. It's because our economy is not dependent on oil. There are certain vested interests, like some of the people you brought onto the show, that believe it is because that's what they've spent their life doing. But I can tell you that if you come to most, most the people, whether you go to China, whether you go to other jurisdictions, they recognize that the future of our economy is in the new economy. It's not by continuing to do what we've done historically historically because we can't compete. We cannot compete with Saudi Arabia. And the reason why is because Saudi Arabia recognized that we are limiting and moving away from fossil fuel energy sources. And what they can get it out of the ground, jet, ground Jed Clampett style by firing a shotgun into the ground and it bubbles up. We have the most expensive oil or so some of the most expensive oil in the world to, to actually uh, get out. So for us to think somehow we're going to compete with jurisdictions that can access that oil through shale oil formation 
operations in the U.S. through 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 uh, you know regular crude in, in in Arab world and elsewhere. It's it's folly. And so what we continue to try to do is race for the bottom economics while the rest of the world is moving forward. Our opportunity in Canada is to actually grab the leadership that we are doing here in British Columbia and say that we want to be leaders in the new economy and actually position BC, Canada, and the whole country in that regard. And it, you cannot, Mr. Trudeau, you cannot on the one hand claim that you are signing on to international agreements to commit uh, to reduce keeping warming to two degrees and then go forward with a tripling of expansion of oil sand production. It is inconsistent. And that is the problem well, here. And then tell people get it, with the, understand this. You, there's no well on this. As a climate scientist for 25 years, I can assert unequivocally that it is inconsistent to keep warming to below two degrees and start to invest in new fossil fuel infrastructure that will be around for decades to come. But it it's just not possible. It and be to pretend zero, it is, is not. It, but it's not a zero sum game. But, and there, there is not a zero sum game. There is a transition period. There's still 100 million barrels of demand per day of oil. Why wouldn't Canada continue to be able to participate in that? Because why? Canada why? Can't just one second. That, one second. That, one second, with the NAFTA well, renegotiations going on and 99% of our mm -hmm. exports going to the United States, wouldn't you want to diversify our risk away from just the United States to international markets? Would you not want that? Well, this is the problem, is that the mark, when Kinder Morgan was being built, the market was California. That is where the, the diluted bitumen was going to be shipped. There is no other mythical market. People are not crying for our high sulfur products. There's a reason why Statoil, why Total, why Shell and other multinationals have divested from the oil sands. They've done so because they recognize that there is far cheaper oil out there. There's a finite no. capacity of oil that we can burn. And why? <laughs> well, those are the realities. And they, you can go they, and look and see that they, they moved oil away. Shell. They and, moved and away. We. They moved they away from the Canadian market because it was too sands. difficult to get business done. It was too costly. No, the taxes that's not why they divested. The carbon you can, taxes you can were high. The reason why they, they divested you did not is because have, of the costs. You did not have a Royal Dutch Shell or any of these large integrated multinational companies invest in Canada. To your point, to say this was a mystical market. You don't see these no, large they, they, you just the reason called, why they divested you called the energy can, the, no, see, again, industry a mystical market. I can guarantee you that so, these CEOs so would I not guess, invest in I a mystical market. The problem market. I have with your argument is, is that you're, you're not listening to mine. Is that I have said that they did invest because this is the cost of doing business. When you have multiple resources around the world, you kick the can in a number of jurisdictions. These multinationals have divested for Canada, nothing to do with in a possible to. They did it years ago. And the reason why they did it years ago, it's got nothing to do with trans mountain. It's because it is the most expensive oil to get out of the ground. It's high sulfur oil. They're, oil, they're committed to decarbonizing and they recognize that there are far cheaper sources elsewhere. And until Canada gets with the program and recognizes that our future is not going to be chasing race for the bottom economics, we're going to continue to lag development in the world. I would suggest that perhaps people should go and travel around China. Have a look at the innovation there. Have a look at the innovation in the street, in the, in the factories and elsewhere. That's because they're Bypassing the, you know, our problem here is that we are trying to push away entrenched technologies as we decarbonize. They didn't have to do that. So it's just like the reason why cell phone ad adoption in, in Africa, Eastern Europe, and in Asian countries was so rapid is because they're not pushing away entrenched they don't uh, have, technologies. Well, they don't That's have the landlines. They don't so have the benefit of, of legacy. Or, or the difficulties that, well, of legacy. No. Let me it's just not the add, benefit let me... of legacy. It's the vested interests that are refusing to change and create arguments that are not substantive that... and are not uh, subject to scrutiny fall apart upon closer look. Like the myth that the Canadian economy is somehow dependent on oil. It is not. I... It is not. It absolutely. It's, it's just a, simply a, not. Well, a significant, and that is just a, a, a fallacy portion... that is perpetuated. A significant portion of our tax revenue does come from the energy sector, and let's keep, be mindful that those revenue do dollars help support hospitals and education. But let me let oh, me just again, ask you. Oh, that's the rhetoric from the from the province of Alberta. So does revenue from the tech sector, of course, but and you so need does it all. revenue from you the forest sector, and let, so let, does re let, re revenue from the manufacturing sector, and so does re revenue from the biomedical sector. But the reality Agreed. is, the revenue from the oil and gas up. sector has been declining as a percentage point. of our GDP because the world is moving on. <laughs> It all adds up. You're no, making my point. I love so we, it. So again, the reason let me, why let me is, ask uh, you. Anyway. Let me ask you because when you and I have spoken in the past, you were a little bit amenable to maybe a pipeline getting built if somehow you could benefit economically. You and I talked about that. 
It's recall? not about me benefiting or BC benefiting. It is about Canada not continuing down this path towards race for the bottom economics, whether it be shipping raw logs, shipping raw diluted bitumen that has to be refined elsewhere. What happens is we ship the export, the jobs, we ship the social upgrades, we ship, frankly, the money that would go to schools and hospitals offshore. Okay. So you're, this is not benefiting you, Canadians. You, so you're and not, so then the reason why people don't want to do it is because they don't like the economic case for bottom it, which line, suggests to me that that is exactly my point. Bottom line, you're not concerned that this is going to have a negative impact on the Canadian economy. You and I are, aren't going to be speaking a year from now and we're going to see the fallout from this. You're not concerned? So I'll replay Bottom, the tape. not at all. Absolutely not at <laughs> all. I right. actually view this as a very positive motion, both for Alberta, which, you know, Alberta's got to get away from its boom and bust uh, economic cycles. And, and you, don't get around, you don't get away from it by continuing race for the bottom. You're continuing giving away resource, not collecting royalties, and hoping somehow conditions would change as the world decarbonizes. That's reckless. So what Alberta should be doing, and what, what I, I saw Rachel Notley beginning to do, is diversifying its economy, recognizing that the economy tomorrow is not one that's going to be putting fossil fuels in the atmosphere. That is a reality because, frankly, there won't be an economy if we don't get a grip on this climate change problem because the effects are so profound that it will be rather moot having discussion about economic growth or, or loss because, frankly, it will be out of chaos. So right. until we get with the program, we, we need, we, you, know, this, we, we, we're, we're, we, you know, we're just going to continue having these same discussions about uh, mythical facts about our oil economy at the same time as missing out on opportunities that exist that we should be challenging.